I'm sure you've heard the story about the guy that was hitchhiking on a mountain and he slipped on the ledge of it and he fell down and he hung on by a rope halfway down the mountain toward the ground and he yelled, help, help. And he heard a voice from above saying, I am God. If you just let go of that little rope you're holding on, I'll catch you. And he thinks about it for a moment and says, help, help. And God said, I'm here. I'm up here. You, you just let go and I'll catch you. And then the guy thinks for a minute and says, is there anyone else up there? Help, help. So God's confidence and ability to save him was greater than his confidence in God's ability to save him. And sometimes that's true in our everyday lives. God is all powerful. God is almighty. Nothing is impossible with God, Luke 1, verse 38. And yet sometimes our confidence in his ability is weak. Well, we're going to find out that that was true even of the people in the Bible sometimes, that they needed a boost, that they didn't need more self-confidence, they needed more God-confidence. We're going to see that with Gideon in Judges chapter 6. We're going to pick up the action in verse 1 like we usually do. Judges 6. Again, <laughs> the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. <laughs> I like that. Again. Or should I say, I don't like that. They just had 40 years of peace. They were delivered by Deborah, the prophet. And they were delivered in a powerful way by God. And Barak and Deborah had written a song of rejoicing over what God had done. But after 40 years, Israel got lazy. Israel got selfish. And they forgot about the Lord their God. And after and it says they did evil again in the eyes of the Lord. And for seven years, God gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Sometimes God allows us to experience the consequences of our failure so that we'll realize that we're experiencing the consequences of our failure. <laughs> and maybe we might look up to God. Verse 2, because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. This group of people that were living high off the land, in the promised land, were now living lives of such fear that they had to hide in the mountains. And there are a number of times in biblical history where People under the judgment of God flee to the mountains for safety and have to hide like animals. Hosea chapter 10, verse 8. The high places of wickedness will be destroyed. It is the sin of Israel. Thorns and thistles will grow up and cover their altars. Then they will say to the mountains, cover us. And to the hills, fall on us. And you remember what Jesus said in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24, verse 15, that when you see the abomination of desolation, when you see the Antichrist in the temple, then let those who are in Israel flee to the mountains. And then in Revelation chapter 6, verse 17, when the sixth bowl of God's judgment is opened and poured out on the world, it says in Revelation 6, verse 15, the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and every slave and every free man hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They called to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come and who can stand? So this imagery of fleeing like mice in the mountains 
is a common imagery of people living in fear under the judgment of God and or the oppression of oppressors. Judges 6, verse 3, whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern peoples invaded the country, camped on the land, and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza, and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep nor cattle nor donkeys. How would you like to do all that hard work and grow all of your product and your produce only to know that the enemy was going to come any day and destroy it all. All your hard work for nothing. Verse 5, the Midianites and Amalekites came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count them. They invaded the land to ravage it. Midian so impoverished the Israelites, verse 6, that they cried out to the Lord for help. They went to God not as their first resort, but at, as their last resort. Only after they had exhausted every human, earthly, self-centered possibility of getting out of the situation. Oh, wait a minute. Let's talk to God. As Christians, of course, we know that Jesus said in Matthew 6.33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. But they cried out to the Lord at the last second for help. Verse 7, when the Israelites cried to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet. And the prophet is explaining to them why this is happening to them. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. So he's reminding him of God's love. Verse 9, I snatched you from the power of Egypt and from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them from before you and gave you the land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live. So he's reminding him of God's love. He's reminding them of God's power. He's reminding them of God's command. But you have not listened to me. That's why this is happening. Because you're not listening. And I'm trying to get you to listen. You know, we don't always think of it this way. But sometimes the judgment of God is an expression of the grace of God because it is God's judgment that calls out to us like a loud voice on a megaphone saying, turn to me now. Hello down there. I think it was C.S. Lewis that said, pain is God's megaphone to the world. And that's what this is. Verse 11, the angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Oprah that belonged to Joash the Abizrite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat. And look where he's threshing wheat, in a wine press, to keep it from the Midianites. So even Gideon, who's about to be called a mighty warrior, even he is hiding in fear and trepidation in a secluded area in a wine press to hide from the Midianites. And normally you would thresh your wheat up out in the open on a hill so that the wind would blow away the chaff and you would have just the good wheat left. But he can't do that because he's in hiding. Verse 12, when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you mighty warrior. There's a sweatshirt that they sell on Amazon for people who are fighting cancer. And I found out that lime green is the color for lymphoma. And there's one that says warrior on it. And I kind of want to get that. And then Jeannie reminded me, well, you haven't had to do any war yet. You haven't had any symptoms and hopefully you never will. It seems a little presumptuous to get a shirt that calls you a warrior when you haven't done any war. <laughs> So needless to say, I haven't bought the sweatshirt. 
But here we have a similar situation. The Lord refers to Gideon as a mighty warrior, and he hasn't fought any wars yet. And I think Gideon feels the disconnect. Verse 13, he says, But sir, to the angel, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our fathers told us about when they said, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and put us into the hand of Midian. Well, Gideon doesn't understand that this has happened because the people had turned away from God and had built altars to the Asherah God and to another God that we're going to read about in just a minute. Verse 14, the Lord turned to him. So apparently the presence of the Lord was in this very special angel. And that's why a lot of people say that this angel is actually a visible manifestation of the second person of the Trinity, the second person of the Godhead, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Now, this is a lot like the Moses story that we read back in Exodus 3 and 4, where Moses is like, I can't do that. Who do you think I am? I'm, I'm just a shepherd. I'm, I'm just an ordinary man. I can't do what you're asking me to do. And don't we all feel that way at certain times, that we feel like the situation is so great and who are we? Verse 15, but Lord, Gideon said, how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my family. God loves to use the least, the last, the lost, the loathed, and the unloved to accomplish his mighty purposes. Because it shows how mighty God is. Verse 16, the Lord answered, I will be with you. That's all you need to know. I'm going to be with you. And when the all-powerful, omnipotent, eternal God of the universe is with you, that's really all you need to know. That's the main thing, anyway. And you will strike down all the Midianites together. Verse 17, Gideon replied, If now I have found favor in your eyes, give me a sign. It's not unusual for the people of God to want a sign from God. Psalm 86, 17, give me a sign of your goodness that my enemies may see it and be put to shame. For you, O Lord, have helped me and comforted me. But it still shows that he's not 100% convinced. So there's that. Verse 18, please don't go away until I come back and bring my offering. The Lord said, all right, I'll wait for you. Verse 19, Gideon went in, prepared a young goat, and from an ephah of flour, he made bread without yeast. That means he, he didn't take time to let it rise. He's making this in a hurry. Putting the meat in a basket and its broth in a pot, he brought them out and offered them to him under the oak. Hospitality was a virtue in the ancient world. Gideon really felt compelled in his spirit to offer this hospitality. Verse 20, the angel of God said, take the meat and the unleavened bread, place them on this rock, and pour out the broth. Gideon did so. With the tip of his staff that was in his hand, the angel of the Lord touched the meat and the unleavened bread. Fire flared from the rock, consuming the meat and the bread. And the angel of the Lord disappeared. When Gideon realized that it was the Malach Yahweh, the angel of the Lord, he exclaimed, Ah, Sovereign Lord, I've seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But then he heard the voice of the Lord. The Lord said to him, Shalom, peace, do not be afraid. You are not going to die. By the way, whenever somebody is afraid, an angel or God almost always says, Don't be afraid. <laughs> I like how they say, Don't be afraid, after they're already afraid. <laughs> but obviously, being told not to be afraid helps the person who's afraid to be less afraid. Hopefully. Hopefully. I'm afraid I'm right about that. <laughs> Verse 24, so Gideon built an altar to the Lord there, and it is called Yahweh Shalom. The Lord is peace. To this day, it stands in Oprah of the Abizrites. 
Verse 25, that same night, the Lord said to him, take the second bull from your father's herd, the one seven years old, tear down, and this is bold here, tear down your father's altar to Baal and cut down the Asherah pole beside it, then build a proper kind of altar to the Lord your God on top of this height. Use the wood of the Asherah pole that you cut down, offer the second bull as a burnt offering. So Gideon took 10 servants and he did what the Lord said. But because he was afraid of his family, remember, this is a guy that was threshing wheat in a wine press, so this, he's a little timid. Because he was afraid of the family and the men of his town, he did it at night rather than in the daytime. Verse 28, in the morning when the men of the town got up, there was Baal's altar just demolished with the Asherah pole beside it, cut down, and the second bull sacrificed on the newly built altar. They said to each other, who did this? When they carefully investigated, they were told, Gideon did it. Verse 30, the men of the town demanded, bring out your son, he must die, because he has broken down Baal's altar and cut down the Asherah pole. So even after all that sin against the Lord their God, even after all that idolatry, they're ready to kill the guy that's getting rid of the idolatry and trying to get him to go back to God. Verse 31, but Gideon's dad, Joash, replied, Are you going to plead Baal's cause? Are you trying to save Baal? If he's a god, then why does he need to be saved? Whoever fights for him shall be put to death by morning. If Baal really is a god, he could defend himself when someone breaks his altar. So that day they called Gideon Jerub Baal, which means let Baal contend with him because he broke down Baal's altar. Verse 33, now all the Midianites, the Amalekites, and other eastern peoples joined forces and crossed over the Jordan and camped in the valley of Jezreel. The Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. He blew a trumpet, summoning the Abizrites to follow him. He sent messengers throughout Manasseh, calling them to arms and also into Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali. These are lands in which the Lord Jesus Christ is going to walk through and minister in someday. So that they too went up to meet them. Now again, Gideon is still a little bit uncertain. He's still building in his faith. So in verse 36, he said to God, If you will save Israel by my hand as you have promised, look, I'll place a wool fleece on the threshing floor, if there is dew only on the fleece and all the ground is dry, then I will know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said. And that's what happened. Gideon rose early the next day. He squeezed the fleece and wrung out the dew, a bowl full of water. Then Gideon said to God, don't be angry with me. Let me make just one more request. This almost sounds like the conversation between Abraham and God in Genesis 18, where Abraham is like, don't be mad at me. I'm just making one more request. What if there's only 30 people in the left that are righteous in the land? What if there's only 20 people? Except Abraham's prayer was filled with love and faith, and Gideon's prayer is like, I'll see it. I'll believe it when I see it. Gideon said to God, don't be angry with me. One more request. This time, make the fleece dry and the crown do. So that night, that's what God did. Only the fleece was dry, but the ground was covered with dew. And a lot of people use that passage to say, well, you know what? If I'm going to get an answer from God, I'm going to put out a fleece. And if I'm going to ask God to do this, and if he does it, then I'll know that it's God's will for me to do this. And I don't think that is what this passage is teaching us. I think this passage is teaching us that God has the ability to use us, but sometimes we don't have the confidence that God has the ability to use us. And sometimes in our lack of faith, we do things like that to try to drum up a little courage that maybe God is going to be with us. So I don't think that this is a lesson that we take on the road with us. I don't think we should be asking God to make the fleece wet or make the ground wet in order to prove whether or not something is his will. If you want to know whether or not something is his will, you got to look at this man. This is what tells us what the will of God is. Having said that, I do admire the fact 
that God worked with Gideon where he was at. And sometimes a little bit of faith in a great big God goes a long, long way. I think that's another takeaway from this passage. Gideon had very weak faith. He questioned things. He didn't understand that it was Israel's sin that got him in that predicament in the first place. And yet he stayed with God and eventually had enough courage to totally trust God. But I just want you to know that you don't have to waver in the wind. You don't have to waver between doubt and devotion like Gideon did. You can trust God completely to take care of you. I love how the angel reminds Gideon of all the wonderful things that God did in the past, bringing the people out of Egypt, bringing them into the promised land. And if God came through for them in the past, they can trust God to come through for them in the present if they repent of their sin and turn to him. And isn't the same thing true for us today, that the same God who sent Jesus Christ to deliver us from sin, die on the cross for our sins and rise again, the same God who accomplished his mighty purposes in Jesus is able to accomplish his mighty purposes in us today. Put your faith and trust in Jesus. Jesus loves you. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. I hope you guys have a wonderful day. Thank you, June. Thank you, Bart. Thank you for all who are watching. It's good to be back. We'll see you tomorrow in Judges chapter 7. Have a great day.